now that we've talked about um, how memory works on a cellular level and lower animals, we're going to turn our attention to humans and some theories for how human memory works and um, and just some of the thoughts on how we translate the findings of lower animals to significantly higher animals. So long-term potentiation is a stable and enduring increase in the effectiveness of a synapse. And it's also believed to be a way that the brain may store information. So essentially these are synapses that behave like Hebbian synapses, like what we talked about before in the last video. So when the when a postsynaptic cell it receives information repeatedly uh, from the presynaptic cell, it makes these synapses stronger than before. And again, those that fire together wire together. So the thought is that um, this may also be used to store information. Now with that, you would expect that since we know that the hippocampus is important for storing information, that this must take place in the hippocampus. And indeed it does. Actually long-term potentiation occurs at several sites within the hippocampus. Um, so why do we think it's associated with learning. Well, first, it results in a biological change within the cells, like we talked about last time. It may, um, we'll talk this time about actually more substantial change within the cells, but we've talked about how it can affect, you know, how much neurotransmitter is used or how sensitive cells are to neurotransmitters. Uh, second, as I just mentioned, um, the hippocampal formation has long-term potentiation that occurs at several different sites. There are actually three major divisions with, within the hippocampus, C1 or CA1, CA2, CA3, um, and all of these have shown some long-term potentiation. Most of the research has focused on CA1, though also CA3 has gotten a fair amount of attention. So how does this process actually work? Well, looking at CA1 in that region, uh, which is the region of the hippocampus we know the most about, the neurons have both NMDA and AMPA receptors. So during low-level activity, which results in low-level glutamate release, only the AMPA receptors are active. So this is, for instance, with normal, you only have the um, AMPA receptor active. The NMDA is currently inactive if it's just normal activity. So the NMDA receptor um, has a calcium channel that's actually blocked by a magnesium ion, as you can see here. So it makes it so only low levels of sodium can enter the cell through the AMPA sodium channel. However, everything changes when there's a lot of activity. So when there's a lot of activity and hence a lot of glutamate, um, as you would have with a cell that keeps on firing again and again, uh, what happens is when there's this increase in activity, sodium flows in through the AMPA receptor channel, so over here, and it depolarizes the cell. If it gets to negative 35 millivolts, then the magnesium ion that was blocking the NMDA receptor gets booted out from the NMDA gate, and that gate opens as well. And this encourages calcium to flow in. So thus, NMDA receptors are only active when, first of all, glutamate is present in a large quantity, and when the cell has already been partially depolarized by the AMPA receptor. So now we have a large amount of calcium filling the cell, in addition to the sodium that's already been introduced by the AMPA receptor. So having the influx of sodium is important because it impacts what are called protein kinases, which um, are enzymes that add phosphate groups to protein molecules. This modifies the proteins, and the proteins then end up modifying the cell. One particular protein uh, kinase, uh, K2, 
calcium calmodian dependent protein kinase or uh, CAMK2 causes more AMPA receptors to be produced and inserted in the synaptic membrane. So as you can see, it's actually a change within the cell that makes it more receptive to glutamate, more sensitive to glutamate. AMPA receptors are also modified to allow more sodium and potassium ions to enter when they're activated, again, making them more sensitive to glutamate. So this is an example of how increased activation can actually change the cell and make it more, um, more sensitive. Um, and with that, having those two neurons you know, become more sensitive to each other and more strongly connected. The activation of protein kinases um, also triggers protein synthesis, or the creation of new protein, uh, through affecting CREB, which is a transcription factor, meaning that it is a protein that changes the way other proteins are made. So thus, CREB binds to the um, CAMP receptor, or sorry, the CAMP response elements in the DNA promoter region and changes the expression of genes, um, which changes their encoding for a wide range of proteins. So because the effective genes may encode anything from new receptors and kinases to structural building blocks used for changing the shape of the cell, the actions can actually be very profound and long-lasting. Um, so with this, there are significant consequences for the neuron. Some of the long-term changes we see from this um, long-term potentiation process are additional synapses, enhancement of existing synapses, like we talked about it with the last example, and the construction of new dendrites and dendritic spines. We don't know that much more about the process, including the long-lasting components of LTP, so there's still a lot that we have to learn about how these memories are formed. So this is just a, um, a whole outline of the process where you have the glutamate affecting the AMPA and then it depolarizes enough so you also have the NMDA receptor open because um, it opens up and it causes calcium to flow in because it reaches that maybe you have 35 millivolts. So calcium comes in too and it affects the protein transcription which affects the way that the proteins are made going forward and overall as long-term um, effects on the overall cell. So I hope that made sense. If not, bring questions to class, we'll talk about it. But the main thing here is showing that increased activation actually leads to a change within this cell. It actually changes it, making it more sensitive um, and also making new connections, and that this may be how memories are stored. So interestingly, not all the changes are actually postsynaptic. In order to encourage this process along, some neurons also have what are called retrograde messengers, or retrograde uh, neurotransmitters. And these are neurotransmitters that travel across the synapse, but go from the postsynaptic to the presynaptic. So it goes the opposite way and affects the presynaptic neuron. And in the case of LTP, long-term potentiation, these neurotransmitters typically encourage the release of more glutamate. So causing, you know, helping this uh, process go along and strengthening that connection. So other than the fact that it happens at the hippocampus, why do we think that long-term potentiation may be associated with memory? Well, correlationally, the time course of long-term potentiation is similar to the time course of memory formation. So long-term potentiation can be induced within seconds and may last for days or weeks. And it's been shown to be um, a flexible consolidation period that lasts for several minutes after um, induction. Further, pharmacological treatments that interfere with this process, for instance, by blocking the NMDA receptors, impairs learning in rats. 
Also nice with the um, CAM kinase 2 knocked out can form short-term memories but not long-term memories, suggesting that this process may be needed for developing long-term memories. Uh, relatedly, mice bred to have more NMDA receptors have better long-term memories, which is really cool. And lastly, behavioral interventions have actually provided the most convincing evidence by showing that an animal doing a memory task induces a long-term potentiation in the brain. So taken together, these findings support the idea that long-term potentiation is a kind of synaptic plasticity that under, either underlies or is very similar to certain forms of learning and memory. So now that we have a sense of how memories are created, um, you know, we can look at the big picture and what we realize is all we really know are just the basic nuts and bolts. And in actuality, large networks are involved for many forms of learning. So thus, very simple behaviors are often studied to get a better understanding of how learning occurs. So an example of this is a very simple behavior, the eye blink reflex. So you guys probably remember from going to the, um, the eye doctor, when the puff of air occurs, the sensory information from the cornea travels along the trigeminal nerve to the brain stem from which is sent to the cranial nerve of the motor nuclei, which causes the muscles of the eye to close. So that's why when you do the little eye puff, your eye closes. So this is the direct route. However, information is also sent to the cerebellum, which t becomes important for conditioning the reflex. So the fact that information goes to the cerebellum is important because the cerebellum is actually important for associative learning. So um, say we start ringing a bell before the air puff. So here we have a classical conditioning setup. The information about the sound of the bell and the air puff reach the cerebellum at roughly the same time and meet up in an area called the interpositus nucleus. Thus, since these neurons are firing together, they link up in a network and those connections within the cerebellum are strengthened. Over time, they become so strong that by just having the ringing of the bell without the air puff, it will lead to the same response because there's enough activation in those cells to cause the cerebellum to pass along the signal to blink. And just like that, we have associative learning. And we know that it's stored in the interpositus nucleus um, because of this. So Pavlov would be very proud. It's important to, it's worth mentioning that the cerebellum is important for many different kinds of conditioning. And we know that, um, and we know this as um, this conditioning is wiped out by cerebellar damage. So if you damage the cerebellum, then this type of conditioning can no longer take place. As you know, uh, we now know that there are a few places in the brain and the nervous system where neurons regenerate. One of those places is the uh, dentate gyrus of the hippocampal formation, which has led researchers to wonder whether these new neurons are somehow involved in memory. However, the role of these neurons has been elusive. Uh, the little we do know is from a study of mice who had the gene that's needed for neurogenesis knocked out. In these mice, we see a notable impairment in spatial learning, but little other effect in other forms of learning behavior. Thus, it's thought that these new neurons may be important for spatial memory, which is highly dependent upon the hippocampus. Now, we would be remiss, in my opinion at least, in our discussion of memory and cognition if we didn't at least mention the changes we see with age. As you know, the average older adult starts having some memory problems with age. So having a change in memory is not in and of itself notable. The question is how large of a change is it? The change we see also depends on the type of memory we're talking about. Older adults often struggle with uncued memory, but they have average memory with external cues. 
Thus, one of the things I tell older adults that come to see me clinically is to keep a list of things. Take notes. Very simple interventions uh, for your average older adult that will bring their processing back up to average with younger adults. There are a few isolated kind of skills that actually improve with age. For instance, due to, in large part to experience, vocabulary improves with age. However, we of course do see many cognitive deficits, such as spatial memory, executive functioning, and navigational skills. So why do we see these cognitive declines? There are several possible reasons. Uh, for one, older adults show less cortical activation when encoding or retrieving is self-initiated. This may be why uncued memory is such a struggle as we age. The deficits could also be due to a loss of neuronal connections and neurons. Estimates range, but rough, by around your mid-40s, roughly, the brain starts losing volume uh, through losing synaptic connections and neurons, which could easily account for the deficits we see with age. There are also problems with cholinergic neurotransmission, like we see with Alzheimer's disease. Lastly, the navigational difficulties could be due to impaired coding by the place cells, which help you remember, um, or which as you will remember, are part of the hippocampal system and are cells that get activated when one is in a certain place. So how can we offset these changes? For several years now, there's been a great effort to create drugs that improve cognitive functioning. Aricept is a drug that is often given in earlier mid-stages of um, Alzheimer's dementia. Aricept inhibits colon cholinesterase, which is an enzyme that disables acetylcholine. So what this does is it leads to an increase in the amount of acetylcholine in the synapses and it offsets some of the symptoms of Alzheimer's. Some other medications have been developed to improve long-term potentiation, but they're still in the experimental phase, and only time will tell how much they actually improve cognitive performance and functioning. Lifestyle factors can also be protective against cognitive decline. Exercise has been shown to help prevent cognitive decline and dementia as having um, as, live, as does living in a favorable environment, meaning one where there's adequate nutrition and also an environment that's cognitively challenging. Also, having a lot of education um, for both you and also your partner um, can be very helpful, or having a partner of high cognitive status uh, because it will help challenge you and keep your mind active. This is actually part of the reason why uh, you see so many older professors who have been around for a long time, but they're still as sharp as they've ever been because they're still using their brain, so they're not losing it because they're using it. 